A study in The Lancet has examined more published and unpublished research than any other with the goal of finding the best antidepressants. It analyzed and compared the results of 522 double-blind, randomized, controlled trials from 1979 to 2016. Those included 116,000 people, 87,000 of whom received an active drug. 21 antidepressants were researched, and they were compared to either placebo or another active substance. The goal was to figure out which are most effective at reducing depression and to determine which are most tolerable. All second-generation antidepressants approved in the U.S., Europe, and Japan were included. In addition, there were two tricyclic antidepressants, amitriptyline and clomipramine, along with trazodone and nefazodone. The studies focused on monotherapy in adults with a primary diagnosis of major depressive disorder, so the results cannot definitely be generalized to children, polydrug therapy, or people with a variety of mental disorders. And of course, the best drug for the average patient is not going to be the best drug for every patient. It's just useful to know, on average, which substances are best. The results of this paper are also limited because the primary outcome measure was treatment response at eight weeks. That's enough time to see a moderate-term treatment response, but it isn't necessarily indicative of how well a drug is going to work years down down the line. In these trials, the majority of patients had moderate to severe major depression, and the primary efficacy measure was how many patients had at least a 50% decline in their depression score. Based on that measure, all antidepressants were more effective than placebo, but some, like amitriptyline, were substantially better than others, like raboxetine. Overall, the most effective drugs were agomletine, amitriptyline, escitalopram, mirtazapine, paroxetine, and venlafaxine, while citalopram Alipram, fluoxetine, raboxetine, and trazodone were less effective. Unfortunately, the most effective drugs also had a tendency to produce the most adverse effects. One of the benefits of a less selective drug, like amitriptyline, is that they have a higher chance of affecting the neurochemical mechanisms relevant to someone's depression. But having a diverse pharmacology simultaneously increases the risk of side effects, which is part of the reason selective drugs, like SSRIs, became so common. Serotonin might play a role in depression for a lot of people, but it's not the whole story. That's why drugs interacting with the serotonin transporter, in addition to norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin receptors, and other targets, can provide a greater benefit. There are some caveats to these results. There's evidence the studies may have been biased, and since 78% were funded by pharmaceutical companies, that's a real concern. The review found that whenever a drug was the novel or experimental substance, it was significantly more effective than when the same drug was older. One explanation for this is that there's a bigger reason to make a drug seem as useful as possible when it's new. But 20 years later, when companies have moved on to promoting other substances, there's less incentive to misrepresent a drug's efficacy. This explanation may or may not match reality. The influence of money cannot be ignored, but it's also not fair to assume studies are false just because the potential for bias exists. In this paper, industry funding was not clearly associated with substantially different results, but some trials did not report their funding, and non-industry funded trials were relatively scarce. In general, there's good evidence medications can be helpful and there's evidence companies are inclined to exaggerate the benefits. The review also found smaller and older studies showed larger effects, particularly for amitriptyline, bupropion, fluoxetine, and raboxetine. Again, bias could be a factor, or perhaps the studies were just lower quality. Either way, the fact that drugs are apparently becoming less effective just because they've been around longer, which doesn't actually make sense, shows the research has to be viewed with some skepticism. The takeaway from this paper is that there is evidence indicating certain antidepressants are reliably superior to others. Raboxetine and trazodone are among those that should not be first-line treatments, while mirtazapine, venlafaxine, paroxetine, and perhaps amitriptyline should be considered earlier. Moving forward, it'd be helpful to have more truly long-term data, as well as data on how subgroups of patients respond to different drugs. Everyone with depression is not the same. People 
people with significant anhedonia, low motivation, anxiety, insomnia, or various other problems could all respond better to different substances, but the evidence on which treatments are best for which subgroups is still accumulating and needs to be analyzed further. A more detailed overview of this paper is available on the TDC website using the link in the description. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. The Drug Classroom is only funded by donations. This content is possible due to listener support. If you want to support, you can do so through Patreon, PayPal, or Bitcoin.